of a, a belief system that has been placed in our lives that is older than time itself because it's based on God and his relationship that he desires to have with man. When we look at where we are and we look at where we want to be, we see miles to go. And that kind of takes us into our uh, message today. The message is, how thirsty are you? And I wasn't planning on this being a hot and dry day. Everybody is probably going to be thirsty before I'm done. Because, you know, most of you have been thirsty. But I suspect that very few of you, many times in your life, have been so thirsty that you would give whatever you had for just one cool glass of water. To be in that position, I think, makes you in a unique situation. It puts you in a whole different light. When you say you're thirsty, it's not a matter of convenience or just simple comfort. It is, in fact, your reality of living. You can become so thirsty that if you don't drink, you will die. The world tells me that I can go 14 days without food but I can only go three days without water. That's a very short time, if you think about it. But that's a truth that i got to be serious about, but here's some things that you may not necessarily have to be so serious about, and they're truth also. It says, accept the fact that some days you're the pigeon, and some days you're the statue. Always keep your words soft and sweet, just in case you have to eat them. Remember to drive carefully because it's not just cars who are recalled by their maker. And if you can't be kind, at least have the decency to be vague. If you lend someone $20 and you never see that person again, it was probably worth it. Realize that it is often the second mouse that gets the cheese. And when everything is coming your way, it's very possible you're in the wrong lane. And some mistakes are just far too much fun to make only once. Those are some crazy truths that hopefully you find a little humor in. But the truth of what I'm talking about today is a thirst, an intense thirst. And if you've ever been there where you were so thirsty that you would give anything you had for just a cool drink of water, you know what I'm talking about. And many of you, probably like me, grew up doing things like walking beans. And I did that for many, many years as a child. And if you've done it, you know that on a hot summer afternoon, there's nothing more unpleasant than hacking your way through a bean field with weeds taller than you most often because my granddad's beans always seem to have more weeds than anybody else's. I don't know why. But as you went around the round, all you could think about was that jug of water that when you got to the other end of the row, it would be waiting there. And I will tell you that there were days that were so hot and so brutal that I began to start fantasizing about that water long before I got to the end of that. And I could always just almost taste it in my imagination. And when I finally got there and finally got the jug of water, it tasted so wonderful. It was so great. That water tasted like nothing else. And you know, we think about that from a human standpoint, but God suggests we consider it from a spiritual standpoint, which brings us to Psalm 63, verses 1 through 11. And David says, O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. And in your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied and was with the fat and rich foods, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate you upon the watches of the night, 
for you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down to the depths of the earth, and they shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be a portion for the jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exalt, for the mouths of liars will be stopped. Now this was a psalm written by David, who frankly understood what it was like to be in hard times. The majority of his life was spent struggling, fighting. As a young boy, he was a shepherd for the sheep. And if you could imagine a 10 or 12 year old boy fighting off wolves and bears, he grew up quickly, understanding the reality of life. And he faced a lot of people trying to kill him. Saul, his father-in-law, Absalom, his own son, all desired to kill David. So this is a man who understands quite well just what it means to be in need. And it's interesting that one time when feeling Saul, in 2 Samuel 23, he's bemoaning. They're out in the desert, and it's hot, and it's dry, and Saul is close behind them, and they're all thirsty. And he talks about, oh, how it would be so wonderful to take a sip of that water from the well at Bethlehem. A well that, as a boy, he drank from regularly when it got hot. He remembered that water and how it tasted as a boy, and he desired it. And two of his men went out and literally drawed water from that well to bring back to him hiding. I believe strongly that David's thirst at that time went into Psalm 63 as he was writing it. He was remembering what it felt like to be extremely thirsty. He remembers what it was like to remember that taste of sweet water, only to realize that he didn't have enough, that there wasn't. He was thirsty. He wanted to be full of water, and there was none. You know, when it comes to God... We too often put our relationships into boxes. And I will suggest to you that the church today is dying because we're not thirsty. We like God. We read about God on Sunday morning. We go to church. We do things. But we're not thirsty for God. In fact, if anything, we'll take a sip or two on Sunday morning and then we'll go, it's enough for me for the rest of the week. Thank you very much. And I'm here to tell you that you can do a lot of things in the world to try and quench that thirst. When I was in the factory, I knew a lot of folks who drank a lot of pop and a lot of coffee because they were thirsty in a hot building. Now I'm here to tell you, the doctors will tell you, that's not a good thing to do. You shouldn't be drinking pop and coffee. You should be drinking water. Today's world, when we thirst for God, is giving us alternatives other than water to quench that thirst, to take us and tell us, this will be just as good. This will be just enough. You won't have to worry about God. And I'm here to tell you, that is why the church is dying today. And is going to continue to die. Because we've lost our thirst for God. We have lost our desire for God to be the number one in our lives. You can tell real quickly just how thirsty you are for God by how much you pray, by how much you read your Bible. If you thirst for God, those will become priorities. If, on the other hand, you just as soon grab a pop or a coffee, catch a YouTube video of a pastor preaching, and say, oh, that was good enough. I've got my fill for the week. I don't need any more. My telling you here, you're thirsty for God and don't even know it. You will not grow and thrive in this world 
with that attitude. Matthew 5, 6 is, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. You see, God designed you to need him. And ever since Adam and Eve, we have rejected that. And like an obstinate little two-year-old, we demand of God, I can do it myself. And you know, we spend our lives doing just that, trying to do it ourselves, trying to do it without God. And again, if you want to know why the church is dying, it's because we're doing it without God. The world will try to tell you, you don't need God. You don't need him anymore. You are strong enough on your own to do it yourself. And you know what? The world is lying to you. I need God more today than I did 40 years ago when I accepted Christ. I needed the salvation some 40 or 50 years ago. And I needed it desperately. But I need it more today because as I live in this world, this world tries to tell me all the things I don't need about God and their lies. I do not think that man intentionally rejects God. Just like Adam and Eve, when they looked at the fruit, the Bible says it looked good. It looked pleasing to the eye. They weren't sitting there going, you know, this will be disobedient to God. This will be utter sin if we do this. No, Satan was there to say, you know what? What's so wrong with something so good? What's so bad about something so nice? You're not catching what God really said. And my friends, if you're not in your Bible, and if you're not praying... That line works just as well on you and me as it did on Adam and Eve. Satan has been lying to us since the beginning of time, and he will continue to lie to us. The question is, do I believe him? Will I listen to him? How do I avoid being fooled by Satan? I'm glad you asked. The first thing you must do is you must thirst for God. And that doesn't mean a 20-minute sermon on Sunday morning. This 20-minute sermon might be okay, but it's not enough. It means doing more. A daily devotion, an excellent idea, but it's not enough. Bible study once a week, good, but not enough. When David said in his Psalms, you are my God, I earnestly seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. David is making very clear that God is more important to him than anything else. And he uses that as illustration that we can so easily understand if we've ever been truly, truly thirsty. We understand what it is. Like I said, I go back to that bean field as a little boy and remember fantasizing about that jug of water. Just, oh, if I can only make it to the end of the row so I can have a good, cool cup of water. It tasted so wonderful because I was intentional about finishing that row and intentional about getting to that water jug. Today in the church, we've lost our intentionality. We have become a group of people who put God there, but not so much there that he interferes with the world or the life around us. We do not want to be so extreme Christians that people look at us funny or criticize us, or in some cases even call us crazy. And we do get called all of those things today. David understood real thirst, real physical thirst, in ways that many will probably not. But he also understood a spiritual thirst. 
that unfortunately too few people understand also. I have to decide, just as if I were in a dry and arid land, and water suddenly became my sole priority, because it was going to be the only way I survive, that God is going to be my sole priority. I cannot say, well, you know what? God is good, but I've got a lot of other things in the world that are good too. And I can live with them, I can handle those. And I'll be honest with you, too much of the world today is all about doing it on your own, making it better. And I'm here to tell you, if I'm not doing it with God, I'm not. I've told you before, if I give you a stinker of a sermon, it's all mine. I, I prepared it and worked hard on it, and it's still a stinker. If I give you a good message, that came from God. There's no two ways between, and I can do both. It's just a matter of whether I listen to God, whether I'm thirsty enough for God to hear His voice speak clearly over my own or that of the world's. It reminds me of a four-year-old girl who went to Disneyland and rode in one of those little, I guess they call it the Mr. Toad Wild Ride, where there's a steering wheel and you steer this toad. And I've never been there, but that's what they tell me. But anyway, after the four-year-old and her father went through these crazy rides while she was at the steering wheel, she gets out with wide eyes. She looked at her father and says, next time you drive, I didn't know where I was going. We have to be a little bit like that little girl in our lives. We have to understand that as much as I'd like to think I'm pretty smart and I'm pretty capable, and I am truthfully, I'm one of those individuals who I do it myself. I've done most of what I've done in my life by my own two feet and I've worked hard and I, I'm one of those people that can real easily tell you how to do it. And I'm too good at taking the steering wheel away from God and saying, let me show you how this is done, God. And every time I do that, I'm in trouble. Trust me, I've been there, done that, and I'm like that little four-year-old girl when the ride's over going, you know, maybe I shouldn't have been steering after all. If you're a Christian who is not consistently praying, who isn't consistently in your Bible, you will, I guarantee you, find yourself lost. Most of you are old enough to remember a guy named Jim Jones. Jim Jones was a crazy man who took a group of people into South America, into the jungle, and fed them Kool-Aid and killed them all. But before he did that, he was a very charismatic preacher. He sold a pile just similar to this, and he talked about God, just like I am. And unfortunately, one of the women who went to South America with him and died in that jungle is an elderly woman who was a grandmother from Des Moines, Iowa. She heard a man who spoke eloquently and spoke clearly but he spoke lies. And because she was not well-founded in her Bible, because she was not well-founded in prayer by herself, she succumbed to the lies of an evil man. And she died in a jungle. I find tragedy in that. I'm shocked by it. And I'm often thought, how could she be so fooled? She had lived her entire life in a church just like you, just like me. She should have known better. But the problem was, her trust was not in her Bible or her prayer with God. Her trust was not in God himself, but in that guy standing in the front. I've always told you that you do not want to put your pastor on a pedestal. And when you look at me, you're obviously right. You don't want me 10 foot above you. Because when this falls, there's going to be earth shaking, and you don't want to be below it. Don't put men on pedestals 
or women. Understand, we are just as human as you are. We're just as capable of falling as you are. And we can fail to thirst for God, just like everybody else can. God is very clear about the warnings of this world. And if I heed them, I can tell you, I see a lot of warning signs today that tell me I don't want to go there. I don't want to go over here. I don't want to get involved with some of the crazy things that this world is involved with and that they teach. But if I'm not founded in my relationship with Jesus Christ, those things begin to sound pretty good. Just like a soda pop on a hot day sounds pretty good. The problem is, at the end of the day, it will not keep you hydrated. In fact, it may quickly dehydrate you. There's an old saying that says you can take a horse to water, but you can't force him to drink. And that's as true of people as it is of horses. To truly thirst for God, David had to become intentional about what he did and how he lived, about how he sought God. And I'm here to tell you, if you do read your Bible and you read the story of David, you will see times where David did extremely well about listening to God and following Him. But you will also find times where he failed, where he listened to the world, he listened to others, and he literally went down bad paths. And not only did he suffer, but his family and his kingdom. He is an example to us of what it is when you thirst for God. He's both a good example and a bad example. Do you want fewer crises in your life? I would suggest you thirst for God. Read His Bible, pray, and listen. And I'm here to tell you, too often when we pray, and I get into this bad habit quickly, I bow my head, I tell God what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling, and I say amen, and I'm done. Prayer is about listening as much as it is speaking. We go to God in prayer, we should spend as much time, if not more, waiting to hear the Holy Spirit speak to us about that prayer. When we fail to do that, we are not listening for God. We are not taking Him into the... We have to consider when we go through our life, how much am I thirsting for God? To be honest with you, if life is easy, it is real easy to take life and just go on and not even consider God. I'll be honest with you. The average Christian can go weeks without even thinking about God if they're not reminded by someone else. And that's a danger. That's a sign that you're too thirsty and you don't even know it. There's a story of a gentleman who took his son out on a fishing trip and they came back in and after a hot run, they decided to go to the coffee shop and the boy saw a chocolate Oreo brownie at the coffee shop and dad said, oh well, I guess you know it won't hurt him. So he goes home eating the brownie and his mom says, you know, you didn't eat breakfast this morning and don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and that you should take better care of your body and what you feed it and what you take care of it. And the boy thought about that for a moment. He says, but mom, the Holy Spirit wasn't hungry this morning. It was when it saw the brownie. Like that boy, God designed us with a hunger and a thirst for him. And too often we skip it in favor of the brownies of life. We take on other things like coffee and pop rather than water for the thirst of God. 
when God's plan is played out in our lives, we will know in our lives a thirst, a desire, a need for Him. I will go through my life realizing that without God, things are going to be ugly. Things are not going to go smoothly. It's not to say that if I do listen to God that everything goes smoothly, but I'm here to tell you that when I listen to God, even when the troubles exist, there's a solution. God has a plan. When I fail to listen to God, when I go off on my own, when I eat those brownies that my doctor tells me I shouldn't eat also, I have trouble. And I have struggles. And I have troubles and struggles that God did not intend for me to have. But because I didn't thirst enough for God, I find myself facing them. My friends, this morning, on this hot day, I hope you're thirsting for God. If you want to have fewer problems, if you want to have a life more in line with God, truly thirst for God, and He will take care of you. Thank you.